Welcome to the Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School. Good to see you. Some of you I haven't seen here for a while, if ever. Welcome. We're glad to see you, Dr. Elder, Dr. And Mrs. Elder. We um, are going to be working in the absence of Dr. Tonstad today. He was scheduled to teach today, and about midweek it became clear that he would not be able to be with us. So we are going to proceed in sorrow uh, without his presence. However, he has sent us a poem for today on the topic of Job that we will share. And he has also sent his daughter, Crystal, to lead us in the reading of that poem. So we have a good uh, time to get together today, I think. Now, very quickly, this evening, there is the New Year's Eve party at the Branson's home. And it begins at 8 p.m. and one stays as long as one's strength allows one. <laughs> Until Bernard exhausts everybody. That's, that's how long one stays. So the address is on the back of this. Please pick it up. If you haven't uh, had one of these in the email that we sent out, it's been there. I think we've sent it out three times. So. Oh, uh, yes, if you really go out of your way, you can, uh, you can create total gridlock with your vehicles. <laughs> and you'll stay with us all night. And my wife and I have questions about our capacity. <laughs> no, uh, uh, it's a long front driveway if you've not been to the Brandt Stater House. A long front driveway with a circular uh, roundabout at, near the house. Uh, we recommend that you go around the circle and then park right on one side. That will leave plenty of room for traffic to get by where you are. And if the place gets, gets over full, then I fear that the street is the next alternative. There are perfectly good people on the street and uh, uh, the celebration will be inside the house, not, not on the street. <laughs> okay, any other questions for, uh, for Dr. Brandstater? Okay, 8 p.m., come in your festive garb. We have here as well, oh, one is supposed to bring some food, correct? Oh, uh, yes, uh, by all means you're invited to bring what Beverly, my wife, describes as your favorite dessert. Okay. But there will be all kinds of other, other things on the menu. Uh, the flyer said hors d'oeuvres. Hors d'oeuvres. Hors d'oeuvres and salad. Didn't mention dessert. Oh, well, uh, you see, you've got a variety of options here. <laughs> yes. And there is another thing. Uh, this is uh, a, a time when we will all be, uh, have opportunity to participate and offer anything that inspires you or amuses you to, to entertain your friends. So, uh, if you can turn handsprings, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> Be prepared for something, because once, not too long ago, I was at a social event at the Brand Stater's home, and everybody was invited to say something, and uh, uncharacteristically, I decided to say nothing, and just enjoy the, after the evening in quiet. But Beverly said, what are you going to say, Dave? So then I had to come up with something. And I think that's the only time I've had to speak, think while speaking. It was just simultaneous. There was no gap between my, my thinking and my speaking. So be prepared on that. We have these tithe envelopes that are marked for the Branson Legacy Sabbath School class. And if you brought a contribution, boy, and I was supposed to and I forgot, uh, I'll have to get this to you for us. However, there is uh, another alternative, and that is since we last talked, our class has been listed amongst the places one can give on the internet. So if you're like me and you forgot to bring your contribution, you can do it so this afternoon on the internet. Because they didn't know we would get on at times. So. Okay. Good. Anything else for us no, or and, and Laura? If did bring an offering today. I'm going to go. I'll see that he gets in okay. after the service. Our our. Presentation. Okay. 
On that, I have a little bit of discomfort, and I'll just share it with you. When, when people give to the university, we know who they are, and we thank them, and we very much appreciate what they're doing. We do not know who is giving what in this Sabbath school. The rules of confidentiality at the church uh, preclude us from knowing that. And I can understand that the church has different and perhaps more stringent rules on confidentiality. But what that means is that Forrest and I and Laura and the other members of the steering committee, uh, Peter and so forth, we know what the aggregate amount is there. We do not know who gave what, so all I can say is we are very thankful for your support. You've all been very generous and we're making good progress financially. I wish I could thank you personally, but I can't. Let's begin with prayer. Dear God, thank you for this ancient, ancient text of Job. Help us to make some progress in understanding it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, as you know, I think there are four reasons why people are not Christians. One of them is the problem of evil, which we will discuss today. A second is the unfortunate way Christians often act, and that has been off-putting for many people. A third is that it is thought that Christians believe superstitious things that no thoughtful person could believe. And a fourth is that Christians believe things that are self-contradictory. So we have these four issues, but the most important of them all, by far, is the problem of evil. And I often tell my students there's only one intellectually respectable reason for not being a Christian, and that is not being able to believe that there is a supremely powerful and good God who loves all beings in light of what we see around us and within us. All other objections to Christianity, I think, are either irrelevant or superstitious. Uh, superficial, not superstitious, superficial. This one really counts, and it counts uh, emotionally and practically, but it also counts logically. So this is the issue that we need to wrestle with uh, today and else times. We are talking about the problem of evil, and we need to put it that way rather than the problem of pain or the problem of suffering, which are ways we sometimes put it. The issue here is a little more subtle than just pain or suffering as such, because indeed there are occasions when pain and suffering have a measure of goodness to them. So what I think we need to do is to begin by thinking of pain as an unpleasant sens sensation of any sort. Then we can think of suffering as a prolonged pain, either because the experience itself is prolonged or because recollection of the experience or anticipation of the experience is, has a way of elongating the pain to make it suffering. But I would say that evil is pain or suffering, one or the other, that is not outweighed by its uh, compensating factors. Pain and suffering can have positive consequences, but when we have pain or suffering that is clear out of disport, uh, proportion to anything that might be of helpful to somebody, uh, we have evil. And when we talk about evil, we think of three things. We think of moral evil, the kind of evil that occurs when people do wrong things, exercise their freedom irresponsibly, but we also have natural evil when people talk about that. We're talking about tidal waves and hurricanes and tornadoes and things like that. Those are the two categories one usually reads about. I like to add a third, ecological e uh, evil, and that's where we're looking at the predatory character of the whole ecological order. And I think that's the most profound uh, challenge to Christian faith. Our whole way of living is predation through and through. We could not be without predation, and one has to wonder how that can be reconciled with a good God. Now, one reason to think about that is the fall, but people began to lose confidence in the idea of the fall, in the Enlightenment, and that presented a problem 
because when people looked at the natural world without the idea of the fall, they began to wonder how this could be God's good creation. And then when Darwin comes along, he has an easy time to show that Paley and Paley's overly optimistic view of the natural world is uh, without intellectual resources. So we have the idea of the fall in the Bible. One idea of the fall is that we have fallen away from some primordial of utopia, but another idea of the fall is that we have fallen short of what will be. So we can fall away from what has been, or we can fall short of what will be, and those are both doctrines of the fall in the Bible, but without the idea of the fall, it really is hard to think about predation through and through. One of the most strange articles that Jack Prov Prov uh, Provencher wrote was on this very issue, and it actually was not well received because he proposed that our ecological order is demonic. That we live not in the world that God created, but in the world that the denominator, Lucifer, or Satan created. And that's when God gave Lucifer uh, over charge of this planet, God gave Lucifer an opportunity to make predation the guiding principle. And that's why we see what we see. Like I say, that idea was not well received, so much so that I'm not sure we'll include it in his book of essays. But I must say, the value of that essay by Dr. Provencher is that it at least took the issue of predation seriously. Most discussions of evil do not take the issue of predation seriously, and to that extent, I think they are uh, shortcoming. But now, Terence Freheim, uh, an Old Testament theologian, I think, has done the best work on natural disasters and the love of God, and you can see several of his things on the internet. A lot of people like Walter Brueggemann for an Old Testament theologian. I do, but if I had to choose, I would choose Terence Freheim because I think he's more sensitive to these issues about the natural world. One of the persons who's written on this is Bart Herman, and he has a book called God's Problem, and the book itself is a problem, if, if I may say so. Bart Ehrman grew up as a fundamentalist, and then he became a liberal Christian, and then he now is an agnostic slash atheist. He uses both words of himself. And his book suggests that the Bible is problematic because it doesn't give an answer to the problem of suffering. If one reads the book, however, Bart Ehrman's problem or difficulty with the Bible is not that the Bible has no answer, but that the Bible has too many answers. He's looking to the Bible to have one well-crafted, uh, inwardly coherent answer to the problem of evil, and when he reads the Bible, he finds different answers that are somewhat at odds with each other, and that causes him to say, the Bible is not reliable in this respect. Actually, Though it is written by an atheist, it would be an excellent book for a Christian course in God and human suffering because it identifies very accurately different ways of thinking about this problem of evil in the Bible in a, in a very helpful fashion. However, where Ehrman sees as, as a problem, we have these different views, I see that as a good thing. After all, the Bible is not a book. The Bible is a library of different kinds of documents written over many different times and places, people facing different issues, and so when one opens the Bible, one does not expect it to say the same thing at every page and every uh, opportunity. Okay, we need to recognize that this is a place where people often lose their faith. They lose their faith when they look around the world and um, something happens and saying God loves everybody just doesn't work anymore. The fellow who wrote the theological dictionary from which I studied when I was a college student, Van Harvey, taught religion at Stanford a long time. Very good dictionary of theological terms, but along the way he ceased to be a Christian. And I've talked to him about this, and he's spoken about it in private, in public. I've suggested that I would be happy to join with him in updating his book, because a lot of theological terms have surfaced since the book. He's no, I'm not going to do it anymore. But what happened? It was just interesting. He said, I woke up one morning and read the Sunday morning paper, 
And I realized I just couldn't say God is love anymore. It was just like that. Um, other people will not have this experience as they look at the world, but they will have this experience when they themselves go through great sorrow and heartache. When people suffer evil in an intense way, it's very easy for their uh, faith to hit a rock and then shatter. Now before we are too critical when we see that happening, we have to think of the cross where Jesus at one point said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There were moments in the experience of Jesus when he felt totally abandoned. And if there is someone in our midst who goes through a trial and feels totally abandoned and can no longer even think the word God with any coherence, the pain is so overwhelming, let's just remember that in that time, that's what Jesus went through. I myself have never, ever felt totally abandoned. I grew up in a happy family. People have been good to me here at work. I have uh, supportive friends. I have never, no matter what has happened to me, I have never, ever felt totally abandoned. Jesus felt totally abandoned. And many people around us feel totally abandoned. The, the pain, the suffering, they experience is just uh, so severe they, they are, are hurt. Now, sometimes I compare it to this. Suppose one put one's thumb on the table and another person came along and struck it as hard as possible with a hammer. That would catch one's attention for a long time. It would be hard to think about the love of God at, right at that moment. So people experience those kinds of heavy, heavy blows and when that happens we should just remember Jesus did. Now, eventually, you know, this is all squeezed together, but eventually he's able to say into your hands I commend my spirit. But that's not just following the first statement. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was a very important moment in that overall thing at which at the end he's able to say I trust. But there, I agree, on the cross what we experience over long periods of time he experienced within hours there are these moments of total darkness, and then after that, there can be um, there can be some sense of trust. But we need to be easy on ourselves and easy on our colleagues when, at least for a while, sometimes it's a while means a years before people people recover from some very 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 heavy heavy blows. What does Job do for us? I will offer a minimalist theology. One can believe that Job teaches a lot more than this, but I think one can say no less than this. So theology is like pizza, right? It can come in a thick crust or a thin crust. And this is thin pizza theodicy. Very, very thin. And this is what, what I get from Job. And people will say, is that all you get? Well, that's minimally what I get. Maybe I can get more, but I don't think I can get less. First point, just three points. Good people do not always flourish, and bad people do not always languish. Very important point. That's from the poetic section of the book. Second point from the prologue, prose prologue. We do not always understand everything that's happening. Now, there are a lot of stories. There are a couple stories about angelic or other supernatural beings having a conversation with God and they uh, casting wagers and plotting and so forth. And one can delve as deeply into that as one wants to. Uh, and I'm sort of reluctant to go very far down that discussion. But. Whatever else we want to say, Job was experiencing something that he did not fully <coughs> understand. There were factors, variables, not to his discernment that were contributing to his pain. And I do think that happens to us today too. Sometimes 
it is only after a period of suffering we're able to see that there were factors that we did not attend to that were contributing to the, to the difficulty. So when we are really caught, I think we might want to say to ourselves, well, this doesn't add up according to what I can see, but there might be other things going on here that I might understand and understand subsequently. Thirdly, on the other end, on the epilogue, I think the answer, we get another answer, and that is, uh, evil is not the final word. Many people are offended by the epilogue because it suggests that Job's family is returned and his cattle and his sheep and his camels and so forth. And people say, that doesn't, that doesn't pay Job for his losses. But I do not understand the text to be saying that these new children replaced the old ones. I understand the text to be saying, those new children succeeded the others. It's a big, big difference. If you lose a spouse and remarry, your second spouse will never replace your first one. But he or she, she will succeed the first one. When we uh, look for a person to hire here, hopefully we don't talk about finding someone who will replace the person who is leaving. We never find anybody who replaces the person who leaves. But we do find people who succeed them, and they come in with new talents, new resources, new insights, and so forth. We miss that which we didn't, we no longer have, but we have something new. So, people wonder how, these pro, how this prologue and epilogue relate to each other. My own, my own view is that the poetic section probably floated around for a long time by itself. But by itself, it leaves some questions unanswered. For instance, by itself, it doesn't tell us which of the speakers in the text really wins the debate. We find that out only in the epilogue, also in the in the uh, poetic section, we don't have anything about the future and so forth. So I think that over time, people who had this po poem in their possession said, well, we really need to add a little bit here, we really need to add a little bit there in order to fill this out because the poem by itself isn't enough. Now, people will say, which of these three was inspired? The poem, the prologue, or the epilogue? And I would say all of it, all of it along with those who transmitted the text and preserved it throughout the Middle Ages and brought it to our attention here. We ought not to think that only the first steps in this long process were influenced by God's Spirit. No, the whole process from the original oral traditions that likely floated around for many, many years right down to how it is polished to the new Revised Standard Version that we have before us today. God's influence was there throughout that whole process, not just at the beginning, so that if we say, well, this may have been added or this may have been added, that doesn't mean that it is any less uh, divinely inspired. It means it's the next step in this long process of inspiration that comes right down to the present time. Again, God is working in every moment of every life to produce as much good as possible at that juncture. We make decisions that preclude some options. I can never again be married for the first time. Neither can a lot of you. You can never unkiss your first kiss. There are some things, once it's done, that precludes other options, and I think that we need to understand that we make decisions that successively specify what God can do. I don't like the word limit because I learned from my colleague Richard Rice that the word limit is a bad word. So let's, and I think he does so rightly. There isn't, uh, Dr. Rice's point is, there isn't anything that can be done that God can't do. 
But there are some things that can't be done, not even by God, because they are inherently self-contradictory. Do I have that correct? Perfect. All right. <laughs> now, how are we doing the time? We've got about five more, uh, seven more minutes. If you wanted to stop at five after. Okay, is Crystal here? <clears throat> I do not see her. I had hoped that we could read the whole of this together. There are several themes that surface in this text. And Hebrew poetry has a tendency to repeat itself. That's part of its beauty. It says the same thing again and again in different ways. But that makes it relatively easy to edit because one can choose the first time something said and then delete the many other times it's said in different ways. So this is this doesn't leave out many things conceptually from the book itself. But what are the main themes? One of them is that there is a strict correlation between doing good and flourishing and doing bad and languishing. That is all the way through the text. It comes up again and again and again, and Job protests against it. But this text, if anything else, if not anything else, is a protest about, against portions of the Bible itself that say, if you do this, you will prosper, and if you do that, you will languish. Deuteronomy is all through there. So this text has to be understood as part of an internal debate within Scripture itself on this matter. And one of the themes in this, in this poem is to say, no, that whole tradition... Uh, has something to say, but it doesn't say what needs to be said <coughs> entirely. The second, that's the main thing. A minor theme is that Job is hiding some sin. And one gets that um, in different ways from different speakers. Now, come on, Job. God hasn't dealt with you anywhere nearly as punitively as God should. God's being easy on you. Your sins are so dark that um, you, sh you should be grateful that God hasn't been more hard on you. So that's a, that's a theme throughout it. A third theme is that Job is impious by even asking the questions. How dare you ask God about these issues? You are a mere mortal, and we know what we've been taught, and for you, to speak this way is to raise doubts in the whole community. It reminds one of what people said about Socrates. Job, you're just making things difficult uh, for everybody. Another theme is Job, if you repent, God will take you back. Job will have none of it. Absolutely none of it. And I'd like to just read a few uh, paragraphs to show uh, this and uh, maybe Forrest, you can give me five extra minutes. Is that okay? Uh, I asked Forrest to time me, so he's not being hard on me. Uh, page three, at the top. After, after this, after his friends had come by, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, let the day perish on which I was born, the night that said a man-child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above it not seek it or light shine on it. And then look at page, chapter uh, 4 right at the bottom. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, If one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? But who can keep from speaking? See, you have instructed many. You have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have supported those who were stumbling. And you have made firm the feeble knees. But now it has come to you. And you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Chapter 6 on page 4, then Job answered, Oh, that my vexation were weighed, and all my calamity laid in the balances, that it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash, for the arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Chapter 8, next page. Then Bildad the Shuhite said, How long will you say these things, and the words of your mouth be a great wind? 
Does God pervert just justice, or does the Almighty pervert the right? The answer, is, of course, is no. Then chapter 9. Then Job answered, Indeed, I know that if this is so, but how can a mortal be just before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has resisted him and succeeded? Though I am innocent, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy from my accuser. Then Zophar, on page 6, I think it is, chapter 11. Then Zophar, the Namathite, answered, Should a multitude of words go unanswered? <laughs> and should one full of talk be vindicated? Should your babble put others to silence? And when you mock, shall no one shame <coughs> you? Then Job answered, no doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Who does not know such things? Chapter 13, Job's still speaking. Look, my eye has seen all this. My ear has heard it and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. Okay, next page. Then Eliphaz answered, this is chapter 15, Should the wise answer with windy knowledge and fill himself, themselves with the east wind? Should they argue in unprofitable talk or in words which they can do no good? But you are doing away with the fear of God and hindering meditation before God. Then Job answered, 16, I have heard many such things, miserable comforters, are you all? Have windy words, have no limit. Or what provokes you that you keep on talking? I also could talk as you do. If you were in my place, I could join words together against you and shake my head at you. I could encourage you with my mouth and the solace of my lips would assuage your pain. If I speak, my pain is not assuaged. Yet if I forbear, how much of it leaves me? Surely, now, God has worn me out. He has made me desolate, all my company. But Bildad answered, How long will you hunt for words? Consider, and then we shall speak. Why are we counted as cattle? Why are we stupid in your sight? Then Job answered, chapter 19, how long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? These ten times you have cast reproach upon me, and you are not are you not ashamed to do wrong? And even if it is true that I have erred, my error remains with me. If indeed you magnify, magnify yourselves against me and make my humiliation an argument against me, know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net around me. Oh, he has put my family... He has put my family... Far from me, right. My acquaintances are wholly estranged from me. Somebody help me. Verse 14, please read it. My relatives and my close friends have failed me. The guests in my house have forgotten me. My serving girls count me as a stranger. I have become an alien in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must myself plead with him. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own family. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I loved have turned against me. Thank you very much. So then, chapter 20. Then Zophar answered, pay attention. My thoughts urge me to answer because of the agitation within me. 
I hear censure that insults me, and a spirit beyond my understanding answers me. Do you not know this from of old, ever since mortals were placed on the earth, that the exulting of the wicked is short, and the joy of the godless is but for a moment? Then Job answered, Listen carefully to my words, and let this be your consolation. Bear with me, and I will speak. Then after I have spoken, mock on. Why do the wicked live on and reach old age and grow mighty in power? Have you not asked those who travel the roads, and do you not accept their testimony that the wicked are spared on the day of calamity and are rescued from the day of wrath? Who declares their way to their face, and who replays them for what they have done? How then will you comfort me with empty nothings? There is nothing left of your answers but falsehoods. Then, Eliphaz, is not your wickedness great? There is no end to your iniquities. Chapter 23. Then Job answered, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Then, he continues, the wicked remove landmarks, they seize flocks and pasture them, they drive away the donkey of the orphan, they take the widow's ox for a pledge, they thrust the needy off the road, the poor of the earth all hide themselves. If it is not so, who will prove me a liar and show that there is nothing in what I say? Then Bildad, dominion and fear are with God. He makes peace in his high heavens. Is there any number to his armies upon whom he does not, does not his light not arise? Okay, we keep moving. Chapter 26. Next page. Have you helped him who has no power? Job is talking to these people. Have you helped him who has no power? Have you assisted the arm that has no strength? Have you counseled one who has no wisdom and given much good advice? With whose help have you uttered your words and whose spirit has come forth from you? Far be it from me to say that you are right. Until I die, I... Oh, I just love this. Until I die... I will not put my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. Over to 31. If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hurried to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned aside from the way and my heart has followed my eyes, and if any spot has clung to my hands, let me sow and another eat, and let what grows for me be rooted out. If my heart has been enticed by a woman and I have laid in wait by my neighbor's door, let my wife grind for another and let other men kneel over her. For that would be a heinous crime. That would be a criminal offense. That would be a fire consuming down to abandon, and it would burn to the root all my harvest. If I, have reje if I have rejected the cause of my male or female slaves when they have brought a claim against me, what then shall I do when God rises up, when he makes inquiry? What shall I answer him? Did not he who made me from the womb make them, and did not one fashion us in the womb? If I have withheld anything that the poor desired, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, or the orphan has not eaten from it, for my youth, from my youth, I have I reared the orphan like a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or a poor person without covering, whose loins have not blessed me, and who was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the orphan, orphan because I saw I had no supporters at the gate, then. Let my shoulder blade fall from my shoulder, and let my arm be broken from its socket. For I was in terror of calamity from God, and I could not have faced his majesty. If I have made gold my trust, or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was great, or because my hand had acquired much, if I have looked at the sun when it shone, or the moon when moving in splendor, and my heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand. This also would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges, for I should have been false to God above. If I have rejoiced at the ruin of those who hated me, or exulted when evil overtook them, I have not let my mouth sin by asking for their lives with a curse. 
If those of my tent ever said, Oh, that we might be sated with his flesh, the stranger has not lodged in the street. I have opened my doors to the traveler. If I have concealed my transgressions as others do, by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I stood in fear of the multitude, and the contempt of families terrified me, so that I kept silence and did not go outdoors, oh, that I had one to hear me. Here's my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, sure. Oh, that the indictment would be written. Oh, that the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me like a crown. And I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. If my land has cried out against me and its furrows have wept together, if I've eaten its yield without payment and caused the death of its owners, let thorns grow instead of wheat and foul weeds instead of barley. Then the words of Job are ended. Then Elihu just has a temper tantrum. Um, it says, all you old people tried and you failed to clarify things, and I will do what you were not able to do. So he takes off on a, on a thyroid. No, tyrant. Then on 41, we find the familiar... Well, I think 36 is good. Chapter 36 on 17. One of the persons said, You, Job, you are obsessed with the case of the wicked. Judgment and justice have seized you. Beware that wrath does not entice you into scoffing. And do not let the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. All right. Then, I think we're at 36. There should be one here. 38, and the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by my words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Or who shut the seas with doors when it burst from the womb? And on and on and on. 40, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. Then Job answered, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but will proceed no further. And then another zoological specimen, page 41. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, for which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself, and repent in dust and ashes. If that's where the poem ended, one would think that Job's critical comforters won the debate. The Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. One would not know that from the poem itself. It would seem that the others have the better of the argument, <coughs> argument from the po poem itself. The Lord bless the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. Or was it 999? Uh, maybe we don't have to worry too much about that. In all the land, I like this one, in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived for 140 years and saw his children and his children's children for four generations. And Job died old and full of days. All right. What reactions do you have? Four, what time is it? It is now quarter after. Okay, we have 15 minutes. First reaction. <coughs> 
I've often wondered why he didn't take Job's wife. Take Job's wife? I mean, why was, why did not Satan take Job's wife rather than his children and his... Oh, that might have been helpful, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it may have been even more painful, maybe. Right. Say oh, that, you're right. That children are maybe more, the loss of a child is more painful than the loss of a wife, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's just it's been curious to me. Yeah. Why well, she doesn't seem to deserve longevity, does she? Yes. What he did A lot of biblical scholars, uh, I realize that were interested in the book of Job, trying to find an answer to the problem of suffering and the evil in the world. I will mention uh, uh, two, two of these uh, scholars, John Calvin and uh, Soren Kierkegaard. John what was Calvin. the first name, uh, please? Calvin. John Calvin. Oh, John Calvin, I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. John Calvin uh, uh, preached approximately 700 uh, sermons in his lifetime. 150 of these were on the book of Job, hmm. paying such a big attention on that. Uh, Kierkegaard, he slept with the book of Job under his pillow that he was so much preoccupied into it, I mean, trying to, to answer to different problems in his life and the world, trying to find an answer from the book of Job. For a long time, I, uh, I believe that uh, basically the focus of the book of Job is on suffering and providing some answers to that. But lately, I changed my opinion. Because I believe that the main focus of the book is not on Job's suffering, it's on Job's faith. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, this faith is the faith of a giant. He's the one that is uttering memorable words among the most memorable words in the Bible. When he is saying that even if he slain me, I will still trust in him. And I try to, to find an answer to, to, to this great faith. And uh, what is the secret of it? And the answer that I found was that Job has the faith of a mystic, I dare to say. Mm. Because uh, his uh, knowledge of God, it was not an ordinary knowledge. It, it surpassed the ordinary into the extraordinary. And, and Job knew God for his great qualities, his power, his goodness, his love, his justice. And uh, in spite of all the problems that uh, he had, trials and sufferings, he remained steadfast in his trust in God. And in the competition that in this book resulted between Job and Satan, even if he didn't know that, Job emerged as the victorious one. In my view, Satan had all the blessings of heaven. He was closest to God and honor more than any other creature in, in, in God's creation. He knew all these great qualities of God, and still he ended betraying God. And yet, Job was superior to Satan because knowing all these great qualities, Job decided to remain steadfast in his trust in God. And I place God among the greatest men of faith in the Bible, Job. Right and, now. and for us, I think it's, it's inspiring and uh, good to follow. And I think that's a fruitful line of inquiry. We can ask, what is the form of knowledge that the mystical experience provides? And how reliable is it? How can we test it and so right. forth? But it is no, there is no doubt that one of the ways of knowing is a mystical encounter. Um, and I had not thought of Job as being a mystic, but I think that's, that's very helpful. Now, uh, while we're thinking of books, my colleague, uh, Dr. Winslow, often mentions a book called The Evils of Theodicy by Terence Tilly. And uh, do you want to say anything about that book? Well, I think, well, Terence Tilley wrote a book on the evils of theodicy, which is, um, kind of lays out the foibles that you see displayed, I suppose, here by Job's so-called comforters. 
I mean, one way to read Job is that it just lays out a whole bunch of bad theodicy and uh, sort of defeats it in the end, but but you're still left in the end with, well, what, what was the answer then, uh, I, I think. It's, it's, some people think that the, uh, the epilogue, of course, is a little too sweet mm -hmm. to me. I think it was probably added by those who felt that the poet poem wasn't sweet enough. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, if, if the poetic section has one point, it would be there are a bunch of bad answers. I'm not sure that the poem provides a good answer. And maybe one poem doesn't have to do everything. But if, if a poem can say, here are some answers that are really, really bad, stay away from them, that might be a, a contribution. Uh, let's see, over here. Thank you, Jerry. Yes, please. Can we assume that Job's wife did stick around to the very end and that she was the mother of these children in the end as well? He, 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 she's mentioned in chapter 19. I never thought of that question. <laughs> That's a good question. What if I he mean, had you four have wives? Her, we have to give her credit if she did. <laughs> ten children? Ten more children? <laughs> yeah. uh, that's a very interesting uh, and um, intriguing question. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder how close Job would want to have been to her. <laughs> How many children their relationship would have yielded? Yes, Ron. Um, isn't it the case that the concept of the eternal life is not a concept in the Old Testament and that the, the greatest good was to live on through your children and your children's children? But um, so he, he gets that reward in spite of all that he's been through. That's the meaning of life. Now, but there's a small point here at the end that I, I'm puzzled by. Their father gave them, talking of his daughters, an inheritance along with their brothers. Isn't that atypical for the women to get inheritance along with the brothers? It is, but what does one make of it? I don't know. Did you hear what she said? I'm sorry? She said he had great integrity. He was going to go against the customs of the day. What do you understand the text to be saying? That, that when a man gives his daughter in marriage, he sends a dowry along with her. Is that correct? But that in this case, not only does that he do that in the, for his daughters, but also for his sons. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, I'm not sure what it means, but it, it seems like he's doing something. Are you saying that he's not doing anything for his daughters? That I don't really know. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. What do you think? No, I'm just puzzled it's, by it's this. It's a strong thing. statement. I thought you only gave your inheritance to your sons. And, and, and oh, the I see. The girls can fend for themselves. Oh, I see. I was confusing an inheritance with a dowry. Anybody want to comment on that? It's a yes, Ladon. Even now, in the Islamic law or the Middle East, daughters are not entitled to inheritance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not entitled to inheritance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Comforts. 
for him. Oh, that's very helpful. She's she's still by his by him. Mm -hmm. She didn't mess his words of his stupidity and uh, the traditions. I think Dr. Tom talked about, talked about the nuns, traditions of nuns. That's very helpful, very helpful. So she's articulating what he is uh, experiencing and giving voice to his pain and not uh, contradicting him. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Elder. One of the things that strikes me very much from Job, <clears throat> God says in the <clears throat> epilogue, you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. What Job said wasn't much better than what the other men said. They're all pretty bad. Mm -hmm. But God honored someone whose theology was terrible. Job's theology. Job's theology. But okay. because of his integrity, he continued to trust God. Okay. There's an interesting dynamic there that I don't understand. Okay, so you're saying two things. One, Job's theology was no better than the others. And secondly, yet God... But he agreed with the others. Sorry? He agreed with the others. Yeah? Basically. Oh, I, okay, let, let's, um, let's, let's hang, hold on to that. How are we time... Is it, let's take the last two minutes and read Sigma's poem together. I don't see Crystal here. So, and I have not read this before. So let's, um, is there anyone who does not have the poem? I hear you, voice from the whirlwind, your summons I cannot deny. I am like a neophyte speaking, yeah, join me. To you I cannot reply, I shall pay heed to your teaching, and I shall have nothing to say. Was ignorance what I was preaching. So tell me, show me the way. Before you begin, let me ask you, my friends and I, who was right? They said all sinners must suffer. This dogma you must not fight. But I, I doubted their teaching, whether of me or of you. I said there's a flaw in your preaching. Your formula isn't true. I won that one. They fell silent. But then they spoke up again. They spoke of the vast remoteness. The uprightness brings no gain. They said, you're too high and mighty to care about me and mine. And I, my life's too flighty. Infinity is drawn the line. I cringed. I felt lost and lonely. Such cruel physicians they were. Is there anyone else I can talk to? Someone else who might care. They said I shouldn't be hearing to speak to you face to face. You are a fire burning. Your wish will end in disgrace. <clears throat> kind voice in the whirlwind. You're speaking, and I was right. On that point, at least, though struggling, on that point, I won the fight. My sense fell short. I admit it. But you will make up the lack. Their cruel says, I'm quit. Heaven and you have my back. So speak, kind and wonderful teacher. Immense the subject will be. Beginnings, the weather, the donkey, the one that we cannot see. The wild goat on highest mountain. It knows not that I exist. It finds its way to the fountain, though hidden by ignorance of bliss. They mentioned the great of my life, the master of faithless talk, poetry's word for Satan, whose term for walk is stock. Can I subdue the body? Look what he did to my skin. I spoke too soon and too boldly, while tradition wore down on me. They looked at me, oh, so coldly, so I countered as I could see. Then you emerged behind the curtain. You broke into my night. You said, you said that it was certain that I had said what is right. May the Lord bless you, and I hope to see you tonight.